I was about maybe eight years old. Me and my dad would bond over playing chess together. And in his eyes, there was no such thing as just let the kid win. And to make matters worse, he would never play chess for nothing. We always had to wager something. Another blogger up. What's your name, man? Derek. Losing is bad. Losing and having to do push-ups was even worse. So I would go to the library, I took out a bunch of different chess books, I started winning. And at that moment, I became obsessed with learning and reading. I had a problem, a book solved that problem. Hey, what's up? So today I want to talk about my favorite types of books to read as an entrepreneur and business owner. Now, it might not be the type of book you think I would read, and I'll tell you more about that in a second. We're actually on the way to the Strand Bookstore, which is why we're in Union Square in New York City today. But on the way to the Strand Bookstore, we're going to be walking past the chess boards. And what's funny about these chess boards is it reminds me of the time that I got obsessed with reading in the first place. I was about eight years old and I would play chess with my dad and my dad would just beat me relentlessly. You know, there's no such thing as just let the kid win. In his eyes, beating me was his way of bonding. Now here's the thing, losing stinks. But we wouldn't play chess for nothing. We always had a wage or something. And I was a kid, I didn't have any money. So he would make me bet push-ups. It was horrible. Before you know it, I would owe him 100 push-ups and he would expect me to give him every single push-up before we ended the day. So now here's what's interesting about this. I hated losing and I wanted to figure out a way to, to fix a problem. So I would go to the library, I took out a bunch of different chess books and I would read these books to get better at chess so I would never lose against my dad ever again. Let me tell you, after reading like four books, I started winning. And at that moment, I became obsessed with learning and reading outside of school because I saw the benefit. I had a problem, a book solved that problem. And that's kind of what I do today. I find I have problems and I read books to solve those problems. Now I want to tell you what types of books I like to read in a second. First, we're in Union Square, so let's go play some chess. sit down after losing that game there. That first game I should have won, but I haven't played chess in like probably 15 months. And it's really annoying when you see the win and you just don't deliver it because I was, it's a, it's a time game, five minutes, five minutes, and I only had about a minute left. And I started uh, to rush a little bit, but he had two and a half minutes left. Let me tell you, losing in chess as an adult pisses me off just as much as it did when I was a kid and I don't even have to do push-ups right now. But anyway, we're about to go to Strand Bookstore, pick up a couple of books. A lot of people think they need to read business books, and I think business books are one of the biggest wastes of time, probably on Earth. Because when you read a business book, if you read like three or four business books, you'll start to see the same things happen over and over and over again. You gotta be a good leader, you gotta persuade people, you gotta manage people, you gotta, got to tell good stories or whatever and it's just like every business book is always the same advice over and over and over again. I haven't read a business book in the last few years that I can honestly say was truly interesting and taught me something brand new or showed me something that I haven't thought about before. Uh, which is why I started reading a different type of book to get my inspiration and I want to tell you about that book in just a second. So let's go to the Strand Bookstore and pick a few up. So, as I was saying, my favorite types of books are not regular business books. They're biographies, autobiographies, and memoirs. And the reason why is because most business books, you lose context of what's happening in the story. Whereas with a biography, you get everything. You get their childhood, you get their upbringing, you got their call to action, what makes them important. I read this book a few years ago. This is the dude that made modern art so expensive. Threshold resistance. He basically taught how to sell art as if it was a business investment and he took around all these famous paintings and started selling it to ego-driven financiers on Wall Street. Awesome book. Now that I kinda shook off the agony of defeat, 
I'm ready to get started. Now, I know I said I basically avoid almost all business books. It's not that I hate business books. It's that most new business books are not that great. However, I've got 12 book recommendations for you today. Many of them are biographies or memoirs or autobiographies, and I do have a couple of business psychology books interwoven into this mix, but I kind of want to just go through the list. Cool? Let's get started. The first book is a book written for children. And this book is making the list because this is the book that I wish I would have read as a child. And it's called, What Do You Do With An Idea? It's a picture book. But the book essentially tells a story about a kid who has an idea and then eventually just goes after the idea because ideas have the power to change the world. And I love this book, especially for children, because I feel like nowadays, Kids need to know that they have options and, then, and that their thoughts matter. And this book is exactly that. So I actually bought this book, read it, and I plan on keeping this book around for a while. And eventually, maybe one, one day when I have kids, I'm gonna read this to them. But this is the first book, I suggest you get it. What do you do with an idea? Now, the second book I wanna share with you is the book that started it all, as I said earlier, and it's this book. Buffett, The Making of an American Capitalist. When I first got started in business, I got obsessed with big business owners. And I didn't want to read about modern businesses, right? Because even though there were a lot of modern business owners that were doing a great job, I felt like their stories were still, you know, playing out. So we didn't know what was going to happen. Buffett, on the other hand, even though he's still alive when I was reading this book, he was just crushing it for like 30 somewhat years. And... I wanted to see how he did it because I felt like he just did it recently. And as I said, the one thing I got out of this book, I remember, was when he talked about the fact that he read the biographies from the people before him, like Rockefeller, Carnegie, and stuff like that. And that kind of motivated him to learn more about business. And that's really why this book makes the list because it inspired me to start on my reading journey. And over the last 10 years, I probably read a thousand books or so. And this is really the book that kicked it all off. As I said, it's because I read biographies as a result. Now, the second book I wanna share, it's the very, ne it's, it's literally the, the, the next book I read after Buffett, The Making of the American Capitalist. It's called Titan. It's all about John D. Rockefeller Sr. And let me tell you, this book is huge. And I never thought I would read a book like this, but just, just holding it makes me so excited because when I learned his story, I was truly motivated in a way that I never thought I could be motivated before. You know, I grew up poor, I came from nothing. My, my dad was in jail my whole life, my mom was on welfare, she later went to school and became a nurse and it was great, but this book was the story of John D. Rockefeller who started from nothing and had an absentee father. So I kind of like connected on that level. Like, oh, he's got an absence. Yeah, I have one too. Oh, that's interesting. And then he just started hustling. And he started a grocery business. Then he got into refinery. He basically followed the money. And even though there's more to life than making money, when you don't have anything, that's really all you can think about. And I understand that. So I appreciate how for him, business wasn't, just about the type of business he did. His business, he went from groceries to oil. He basically followed opportunity. To him, if he was alive today, he would be like an Elon Musk type character going for space or going for electric cars or going for whatever had the biggest opportunity, or at least I think he would be anyway. But that's kind of what he did and he followed the opportunity. And for me, that was very motivating because I realized at this point, I had already started a web business, I was already successful. I had quit my first web business and I went into corporate America and I kind of like wanted to do the corporate thing. But reading this book re-inspired me to start thinking about going back to being an entrepreneur again after I kind of lost my way a little bit the first time in 2008 or so. So it kind of, hits home for me in, in the way that I know it fired me up like no other. Now, some of the lessons that I took from this book, 
couple of things. One of my favorite lessons is the fact that he used to read his hate mail at the dinner table. And if you've been watching Social Triggers or my videos for any length of time, you know that I love to make fun of haters all the time on Facebook, Instagram, and videos. So I kind of really appreciated that about this book, and I kind of still hold it you know, closely to me today. But there's a couple of other lessons, like how he did some business dealings, how he persuaded people to get on his side, how he actually set up his his business structures and everything like that because he built the first global corporation and that was all super interesting as well. I suggest you read this book, Titan. Now, the next book is literally the book I read right after Titan, right? Buffett said you have to study the greats that came before you. So I read Titan. Let me read about one of his contemporaries. Carnegie is the next book that I read. And then this book called The Tycoons, which was about Carnegie, Rockefeller, Jay Gould, uh, J.P. Morgan, and stuff like that. So now these two books I'm holding together for a simple reason. I love Carnegie's story because he was an immigrant that came over from Scotland and he worked his way up. He started as a Morse code operator, befriended the right people, got the right opportunities, and really just showed that he was going to be the best person at whatever it is he was doing. And that's how he got to the next level. So I actually hold this close to me today because I feel like nowadays nobody gives anything their all anymore. They kind of half-ass things. And it's, it's kind of a bummer. They might say like, well, I'm not gonna do a good job here because it's not my passion. But that's not the case. If you wanna succeed now or later, you need to put your best foot forward no matter what it is you do. It's important for building the habit of excellence. And I feel like nowadays people just call it in. They don't give their all to something as monotonous as answering email, as an example. But he started as a Morse code operator, gave it his all, worked his way up. I love that story. Now, the reason why I group this with the Carnegie book is because in the tycoons, there is one story about Carnegie that changed the way I think about the world. And it was as simple as this. Carnegie got a call on the Morse code operator basically on the Western Union line or whatever it was. And they basically said, hey, the train fell off the tracks. The train fell off the tracks. What do you want us to do? And he thought quick. Tom Scott, who was his boss, was away on business, so he wasn't there to make a decision. So Carnegie crunched some numbers and fired back a Morse code. Burn the train. Think about this. This kid at the time, he's like 16, 17 years old. He's telling people to burn the train. Tom Scott comes back. He's like, what'd you do? You burned my train. I can't believe it. He's like, well, here's my, here's my rationale. And he just worked out all the numbers and he showed them burning the train was actually better financially than trying to fix the train. And what was interesting was that created the new way they dealt with broken down trains. When a train would break down, they would burn the train all because this punk kid realized it was better to do that. It's one of the reasons why I like the Coco Chanel book that I told you about the other day. Remember, she had a sweater and she didn't like that the sweater you know, was too tight around her head when she pulled her head through it. So she cut it down and invented the cardigan. Essentially, the thing that great people all share in common, whether it's a business owner like Carnegie or a fashion designer like Chanel, they see what they want, they take their emotions and bias out of the picture and just get to what they're trying to get to. So that's why this book goes hand in hand with Carnegie because that told that story, but that wasn't in the Carnegie biography. So I loved it. Now the next book is Commodore Vanderbilt. Now this book is written by a guy, Edward Renahan Jr. There's been some talk that Edward Renahan may have forged some quotes, made up some stories. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. But this book is about a person that lived 150 years ago. And for me, whether it's an accurate depiction is important, but I was still inspired by it, even if it was inaccurate. And the reason why I love Commodore Vanderbilt, because actually, you know what my favorite thing about Vanderbilt was? And I gotta say, he built Grand Central Station and he erected a bronze statue of himself that cost like $700,000, back then dollars. Or some, well, maybe it was in 700,000 of today's dollars. He built a statue of himself in Grand Central Station. That to me is very funny and, and kind of interesting because here's this guy that became, you know, started from nothing in boating, then transitioned to railroads and steel and, or, or whatever, and eventually became one of the richest people in the world. And 
he was so narcissistic that he felt the need to build a statue of himself that would last four centuries. It's kind of interesting, and I, I, I like that story. But the thing that I like most about Vanderbilt is he was uneducated. And there was a quote where one of the reporters asked him, he's like, hey, you know, Vanderbilt, you don't know how to read. And he just responded with, you know, if I spent my life learning how to read, I wouldn't be good at making money or making business or something like that. That might be a forged quote, but based on what I learned about Vanderbilt, I wouldn't be surprised if that was true because he had that no-nonsense attitude. He would run this huge business by day, then he would go drink by night, and then if someone tried to offend him, he'd get into a fist fight at the bar. Like, this guy was really, like, just a rough and tough dude that just got it done at all costs. And I, while I don't think his personality would be good in today's standards, I appreciate it for how he approached problems back then, given the, the time period. And I always liked that he had the whole all or nothing mindset. Like he was going to get it done or he wasn't. And it, it, it was just great to see that type of passion. So this is the other book, Commodore, The Life of Cornelius Vanderbilt. Now, keeping in this, I want to share one of my favorite books that's not business related. Like I said, I shared a few biographies and I shared that children's book. But this book is a book I think every marketer, writer, anyone who's in the business of selling, if you're trying to persuade people to do anything, you have to read this book. And it's called Age of Propaganda by Anthony Prakanis and Elliot Aronson. Now, if you don't know, Elliot Aronson is probably one of the, the, the modern fathers of writing, of persuasion and psychology. He's the guy that kind of, I, I don't want to say invented it, although some may say that he did, but this idea of behavior psychology and stuff like that, he's one of the original writers and psychologists that talked about this stuff. And this book just kind of goes into all this different detail on persuasion and propaganda, whether you want to use it for good or for bad, really. Uh, one of the examples that I recall out of this book that really is interesting to me is they had this example where they were trying to persuade housewives to eat meat that they wouldn't usually eat during the depression. Uh, you know, the, the other organs and stuff like that, the stuff that people didn't want. And they wanted to see what was more persuasive. If they had a, a professional speaker get on stage and talk to them about why they should eat this meat. And they would explain the nutrients, all this stuff, all the logic behind why they should eat this meat that they would usually throw away. In the other group, they got together, you know, they broke up groups and they basically elected a team leader. And it was up to the group to decide why they should eat it. And essentially, all that really changed was instead of hearing some guy on a stage lecture about why they should eat it, they basically put these people at a table and told them, hey, you tell us why you should eat it, whether you agree or not. And what was interesting is just the mere fact of making them promote eating it, whether they believed or not, made them more likely to want to eat this stuff. All right, this next book, like I said, I shared a lot of biographies. I shared one of my favorite psychology books. Now I want to share one of the best business books probably ever written. And it's by Jay Abraham, Getting Everything You Can Out of All That You've Got. This is one of those books that you can read a hundred times and every time you read it, you'll pull out a new idea. Let me give an example. I read this book probably once or twice and, you know, I, I have my, my stuff. Like, I, I have these things that I learned from and I have things that I liked. On a third reading, I randomly spotted, like, a two-paragraph description of where he said, one of the best things you can do is create a database of your happy customers. I was like, wait, what? A database? Like, a testimonial database? It was, like, two sentences. And I just looked at that one day, and I was like, testimonial database. And at that moment... I just started having my team, every time someone would say something nice about us, we would take a screenshot, put it in, it, it, in an Evernote. Take a screenshot, Evernote. Screenshot, Evernote. Screenshot, Evernote. Someone would say something nice, hey, could you share more? Evernote. And it's interesting because people only think about harvesting testimonials of happy customers when they need it. They're like, oh my, okay, I have this big launch coming up. Oh wait, I, should, I need some testimonials. And then they try to figure out how to get the testimonials. But in this book, there was that one two sentence comment about creating a testimonial database. And it just became a habit in our company to take these screenshots. And what's great about that is then when I went to launch some products, I didn't have to try to find testimonials. I would have them already. So this is one of those books, like I said, you read it once, twice, three, four times, you'll keep finding new ideas to make your business better out of this book, which is why I'm recommending it. 
they don't really make books like this anymore. Not business books anyway, or at least I haven't read one. But this is a great business book. Now back into the, in the genre of biographies, this is probably my favorite autobiography, As I See It by J. Paul Getty. I didn't know about J. Paul Getty until a few years ago, but what was really interesting about J. Paul Getty is that in, I think, 1955, Fortune said he was the richest person in the world, and some people believe he stayed that way for about 20 years. And what was interesting about this, he did it in an industry that was already alive and well. He made his money in oil, Getty Oil, as you probably know. And what's interesting is when he started it, Rockefeller was already at the top of the oil business. So he was able to make a name for himself in a mature business. Actually, when he started getting going in oil, it was like 1910 or so. And oil was already a thing for like, you know, 60 years. So he went into an old business and still made a name for himself. And that, to me, was always exciting because how many people do you know think about a business and they're like, oh, there's way too many people in the world already doing it. There's no way I can do it, right? Anyone can do it. The next thing I like about J. Paul Getty is that he started to share some of his advice later in life. And a lot of his advice in this book is great. I recommend you read this book. It's a fast read. Uh, but one of the things I like most is he did a column for Playboy magazine in the early 1960s. It seems weird. Why would the, one of the most successful business people in the world do a column in Playboy magazine? And when they asked him, he actually had a very simple answer. He said, look, I'm writing these articles because I want the youth and young people of today to be inspired to do something great in their life. And right now, the youth is reading Playboy magazine. That's an interesting insight because all he's really saying is it doesn't matter where your people are. You need to go where they are and get their attention where they're at. A lot of people try to create the attention by getting people to come to them, and that's a great way to do it, right? But like, you could also just go where the attention already is and get their attention that way. So this is one of the reasons actually why I'm doubling down on YouTube is because right now YouTube tends to skew a little bit younger. And social triggers, if you look at my age demographics at social triggers, we tend to hit that 25 to 55 market. We don't have very many young people. I don't have those early 20 year olds on my email list. I don't have early 20 year old people or even late teens. And what's interesting is it's like, I wish I had someone like me giving me advice when I was 17 years old. I got started early, mind you. I got started in 2005, right before my 21st birthday. So I started when I was 20. So I got started in business you know, pretty early in my life. But I wish I got started five years earlier. And that's why we're on YouTube. Again, to reach the people that we want to reach, the younger people. Great book. Now this next book is the Spielberg biography. This biography is fantastic, mainly because it's the story of the guy who became one of the world's greatest directors. But what I love about his story, and I've talked about this before, maybe you might remember it, but I love this story because he always wanted to be a director ever since he was a kid. And he, there's, a, there's a comment in here where he tells his dad that he wants to be the director, and his dad's like, all right, well, you gotta get a job, you gotta work your way up, you gotta fetch the coffee, and he tells his dad, he goes, no. The first movie I work for, I'm gonna be a director. Or in other words, he didn't wanna work his way up, he just wanted to cut the line. Now, I don't believe that you should be egotistical enough to believe that you're able to cut the line. But he didn't really cut the line. He just said that he wants to be a director, and that's exactly what he did. He didn't wait for permission from anyone. He just started directing his own movies as a child. He started getting the experience when he was young, making home movies and stuff, when he was 10, 11 years old. So he just started directing for himself. That by the time he applied for a director's position, he already had experience. But the point is, is that if you want to be some, the point is, if you want to be someone, there's a proven path to get there, right? The work your way up path. But you also could just go be that person and start right now. You're not going to be very good, and that's fine. But just start doing it and get better. It's kind of, again, look at this. Look what you're watching right now. Look at my first or second vlog from January 1st, January 2nd, 2018. Wasn't that good. We're getting better. Because I wanted a vlog, and the best way to get better is to keep doing it over and over again, and that's what we're doing. That's why I love this Spielberg biography. This next book 
is a book called Made in America by Sam Walton. Now, if you don't know who Sam Walton is, I'd be surprised, but he's the guy who created Walmart. Now, I know Walmart has a bad rap nowadays, but you can't deny how fantastic Sam Walton was as a businessman because he essentially created the big box store as we know it. And there's a lot of awesome lessons in this book. I could literally talk about this book probably for an hour, but I want to pull out just one lesson. He wanted to create a big box store that sold everything at low prices. The way he got started is he went to underdeveloped communities and created the stores there. He actually had a plane that he would fly himself to these underserved communities just to scout locations to build these stores. Now, this is important because a lot of people believe they need to go where the people are, and you do, right? But it's more expensive to start a store in New York City, as an example. So he didn't go to city centers. He went to underserved communities as a way to get a, str a stranglehold on the rest of America. And it was a really fantastic strategy. And that's probably the number one strategy I could share from this book, is you should go where the competition doesn't necessarily have the biggest stronghold, and then kind of work your way in. This next book is called Fooling Houdini by Alex Stone. Now, you may recognize this book because when I did a podcast back in 2012, I had Alex Stone on my podcast. I love this book for one reason. This is a memoir or a story about how Alex Stone wanted to become a magician, and he kind of talks about you know, his, his troubles and tribulations on trying to learn magic. But that's not why I love this story. I love this story for one reason. In this story, I learned about a magician who created a trick that was so unbelievable that he got disqualified from the Magic Olympics for cheating. Think about this. The judges basically said, if you don't tell us how this trick is done, we're going to disqualify you. He didn't want to reveal it. They disqualified him. And they took his title from him. Now, this is infuriating on so many levels because he was shamed in the Magic community for cheating. A few years later, he finally revealed this how he did the trick and it was clear that he didn't cheat but the reason why I like this story is because sometimes you're going to approach something in life and you're going to do something so good that people around you are going to think you're lying that's not on you that's on them and sometimes we feel the need to justify ourselves to those people and you know what I'm surprised that he didn't considering his reputation got put through the ringer but I also appreciate the fact that he didn't. Because in the end, your self-worth can't come from the validation of other people. It should come from yourself. And that's what he did. He made himself very happy by not revealing the secret. Later down the line, he did reveal it. I appreciate the fact that he was willing to just keep it inside and not reveal the secret for so long. So those are my 12 favorite business books, biographies, and other books that I've read. And I wanted to share them with you today because people know that I'm an avid reader. But, and they're always asking me for book recommendations, but I don't really make book recommendations. I mean, not until now anyway. The reason why I don't make book recommendations is because for the most part, I read so much, I can recommend a book every single day of the week, right? But the big problem with book recommendations is this. People always ask me for book recommendations, but they don't really want them. They just wanna see what I'm reading, right? And then what I love is when people say, hey, Derek, can you recommend a book for me? And it's like, well, I've read so many books. Where do I start? What problem are you having? Do you want inspiration? Do you want business advice? Do you want a specific skill? Do you want no skill at all? You want to be entertained? Like there's so many reasons to have books. And when people ask me for a book recommendation, it's like, I don't know where to begin. However, I wanted to change it up today because a lot of people saw my Coco Chanel video the other day and, said, and they said they really liked it. So I wanted to take a second to share some of the other books that really changed my life. Now here's what I want you to do. If there's a book that changed your life, I wanna hear about that book in the comment section below. Do it right now, then like the video, and of course, if you like these daily vlogs that I'm doing, do me a favor, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification bell, and I'll see you in the next video.